Well, brothers and sisters, welcome to Praying for America. It's great to be with you as we gather patriots and Christians from across this nation and guests also from around the world. Uh, we have a special guest with us tonight, somebody with whom I have spent some time uh, in person and seen up close the work he is doing. Uh, let me uh, introduce him and then we'll go into our scripture, our prayer, and our conversation. Uh, Mr. Mark Meckler uh, has a uh, law degree and practiced law uh, for a while and then was one of the original founders of the uh, Tea Party Patriots uh, uh, here in the United States of America. Uh, and after serving uh, that movement, he decided to uh, embark on a cause that he is going to explain to us uh, here today. Uh, it is the Convention of States. And what this is, is, uh, is an effort rooted in Article 5 of our Constitution. And uh, Mark, when we begin our conversation, I want to actually read that article for our audience. Um, but uh, uh, Mark, my friends, is really leading an historic, historic effort. Uh, the theme behind which, as he will be able to explain uh, very well, is that power needs to be transferred from uh, Washington, D.C., back into the hands of the American people where it belongs. Mark Meckler, welcome so, welcome so warmly to Praying for America. It's an honor to be with you. It's, it's actually funny to see you on a video screen because we've spent so much time face-to-face -face at events together. That's right, and I look forward to, uh, to that happening uh, once again. Well, I'm eager to get into this with you and help our audience understand uh, and get behind your, your efforts here, but let's start with the Word of God. Uh, there's a scripture here that I think uh, uh, applies very well to this theme. It comes to us from the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel, uh, starting in um, verse 42. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials make their authority felt. It cannot be that way with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must become the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. Let us pray. Father, the sending of your Son, Jesus Christ, into the world revolutionized our politics, turned inside out our forms of government, which among the pagans said that the law comes from the mouth of the king, and your people, O God, had no input into it and no recourse against it. But in Jesus Christ, you taught us and you brought about the fact that we are sons and daughters of the king, that we matter, that our voices matter, that our votes matter, that power belongs to us, and that those in high office are our servants, the servants of our rights, the servants of those rights that you yourself, O oh God, have placed within our very nature. So we thank you, Lord, for the, the, the revolution that has been brought about by by the Son of God in the way we govern ourselves. We thank you for a system of self-governance where indeed the power is and should remain in our hands. And we ask you, Lord, for the necessary strength and vision, the necessary unity and perseverance to save this nation and to save this form of government. Enable us to see what must be done and to join together to do it for the good of our fellow citizens of our children and our grandchildren, and of generations to come. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, so Mark, I've got here my pocket version of the Constitution. And as you know, Article 5 is significantly shorter than the four that precede it. And it says this, The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution. So, how do you amend the Constitution? Okay, uh, 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 two-thirds of both houses. And then it goes on to say, or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states shall call a convention for proposing amendments, which, in either case, shall be valid to all intents and purposes 
as part of this Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states or by conventions in three-fourths thereof. And then it goes on with some other details. Article 5 basically answers the question then, how do we amend this Constitution? Um, as you know, you know, the other side talks about a living, breathing document, but what they mean is you can rewrite it in every generation, which is ridiculous, or rewrite it every month if you want. It's not about rewriting it, uh, but it, it, you know, there is a truth there that it's living in the sense that the possibility of amending it was understood by the founders and they gave us a process to do it. But that process is, is a steep hill and it should be. It's rightly uh, difficult uh, to amend this founding document. Um, you are um, doing, a, 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 as I already said, a, an historic work, in my view, historic work. Tell us about uh, this convention of states that you are heading up. I appreciate that. And by the way, thanks for opening with the passage that you open with it. Our organization, Convention of States, operates on the basis of servant leadership. And all of our members are required to read a book called Servant Leadership. And, and we understand that our job is to serve first. And, and the first that we serve is we serve God. That's where we start. We serve each other. We serve the grassroots. We serve our mission. We serve the country. But always putting God first and knowing where the glory resides. But service is the core of it, which is odd for a political organization. Yes. <laughs> we are Isn't as, it? Yeah. We are yeah, as it's you about a political organization. Yeah, it's not about power. It's about it's about helping people. Right, and and you also couched it correctly in that our goal, and this is where you see the service orientation, is to take power away from Washington, D.C. and give it back to the people and the states. And I think you could even put this in, in what I would describe as Catholic parlance, and I actually learned this from a Catholic friend many years ago, is we believe in the concept of subsidiarity. Right. And Governance should be held as close to the people who are affected by that governance as is possible and practicable. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're trying to do. Take the power away from the federal government, give it back to the states, back to the localities and back to the people. From, from my perspective, as much in the hands of the individual as is possible and practicable. And that's what the framers intended. Now, we have 27 amendments to the Constitution. All of them have been given to us by the first method, which you described which is whenever two thirds of Congress propose an amendment, both houses, it goes out to the states for ratification by three quarters of the states. What we've never done is held a convention of states, which is whenever two thirds of the states want to make suggestions, then what they do is they gather in convention, they propose amendments, and the states ultimately send that out to ratification by the states. So we've never done that. And what that means is we haven't had amendments really that limit the power and the scope and the jurisdiction of the federal government. What the framers told us in 1787 in convention is that they knew that the federal government would get out of control and they knew a time would come when it was unresponsive and they knew that they had to give us a method whereby we could rein it in, we the people acting through our states. And so that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to call a convention. And what we're trying to do, and I think this is the simplest way to put it, we're trying to answer the question, who decides? Most political debates are what should be done Right? Should we have Obamacare, not Obamacare? All these fights that we have, what should the tax rate be? What should the corporate tax rate be? Those are all what debates. This is a question of who decides. In other words, should we, the people in the states, and we as individuals decide for ourselves, or should faceless bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., often thousands of miles away, decide for us? We lean towards the we should decide for ourselves. You know, Mark, I often point out to people, we are the United States of America. I mean, just the name of our country says to us something that I think we often forget. Uh, I think when people think about government politics, they automatically think of the federal level. They think of us as one nation, and of course we should, we are one nation, but that the states created the federal government, not the other way around, I think is an important insight and it ties into what you're doing, isn't it? Yeah, I agree with that. There's an interesting language transition that took place. In the early days of the United States, if you were referring to the United States, you would say the United States are. And today we say the United States is. Ah, uh, yes. created a single entity versus a group of entities that have come together in, under a form of constitutional republic. So I think we have a broken view of the country, even linguistically today. 
Yeah, and, um, and you know, this is where uh, you know people will sometimes look at, of course, with all the battles that have been uh, uh, undertaken about election law. It's been an education, I think, for a lot of people. How wow, it's so different from state to state. Yeah, and you now, and of course, in a sense, that's a burden. In another sense, it's exactly as it should be. Each state has its own government. We've got, we've got, we've got fifty uh, legislatures. We've got fifty court systems. We've got fifty chief executives. You know, and 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 this is how it's supposed to be. Going back to to Article Five that we that we we just read or most of. Um, are you saying then that when you look at these two ways of amending the Constitution, the first one, which has been the only one that's been employed so far, is um, if, if federal officials are responsible for making that work. You have to have two thirds of uh, the, the House and the Senate of the U.S. Congress. And that the second way, tell me if I'm, I'm saying this right, that the second way, the Convention of States, that's a state-initiated method, and, and that, therefore, that's the appropriate vehicle if the purpose is to limit federal power. Yeah, that's exactly correct. And let me give you a couple of very well-known examples, and, and this will paint a very clear picture. So first is the idea of term limits. For literally 30 years in the United States of America, public polling agencies have been polling the idea of term limits on Congress. They'll never impose term limits on themselves. They never have, they talk about it, they never will, because it's not human nature. And this is really important, we gotta understand human beings are sinful, flawed creatures. We like power, it's the nature of human beings. We like centralized power. So the idea that we would limit the time that we can serve ourselves once we're in office doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So if we want term limits, it has to be people outside Washington DC that will impose that. A second uh, great example is the idea of a balanced budget amendment. Again polled by public polling agencies, many of them over the last 30 years, 80 to 85 percent of Americans think we need to impose some form of a balanced budget amendment on Washington, D.C. The idea that they can spend infinitely forever is very appealing to officials in Washington, D.C., but most of us understand common sense wise, you can't spend more than you bring in forever and eventually that house of cards is going to come down. So they'll never impose that on themselves. And the only way we're going to limit their power to spend money, to print money, to tax us into oblivion is if we, the people in the states, impose that limitation. So, Mark, how does this work, and how far along are we now to making it work? How does, practically, this convention of states get convened? So, structurally, the process requires two-thirds of states to make application to Congress for a convention. What that means is each state has to pass a resolution through their House and Senate calling for a convention, and all of those calls or applications have to be on the same basis. So in our case, there are three subject matter areas, imposing fiscal restraints on the federal government, imposing term limits, not just on Congress, but also on the deep state, federal officials, so they can't serve forever, staffers and people like that. And finally, anything that would limit the scope and jurisdiction of the federal government. That means saying things like, no, you can't be involved in education or healthcare, or energy, the things they should never be involved in. So when 34 states or two thirds of states have passed that resolution through both houses. That's when the convention will be called. As of today, 19 states have passed that through both houses. So we're well past the halfway mark. Uh, we're being heard this week. Actually, as we speak, we've already passed the Wyoming Senate. Uh, hopefully we'll be heard in the Wyoming House today. It's their end of session today. Hopefully we make it under the wire. Uh, in Iowa last week, we passed through House and Senate subcommittees and a House committee. So we're moving on to the floor of the House hopefully the Senate committee this week, and then we'll move on to the floor there. So 19 states so far, and we're on our way to 34. Mark, does, does, does the buy-in of a particular state, uh, calling in other words, as you just described, 19 of them have done so, calling for this convention, does that expire? Or, or, or is it there until the state might, for some reason, reverse it or retract it? Yeah, the latter. So it does not expire by nature. Uh, that sits on the books forever once the call has been made, unless the state does what's called rescinding. They do so by the exact same methodology. The only right. exception to that is you, a state can put what they call a sunset clause on it, which means that it'll expire after five years or 10 years. We've had four states do that so far. Of the four, two of them have already rescinded their sunset clause. 
and we expect the other two will rescind them in the next in the, either this session or the next session. Oh, so in other words, that means they'll they'll stay permanent as well. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So that's interesting. So we're more than halfway there. Um, how um, are you promoting? I know you have some influential people uh, speaking up for this, traveling around and 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 uh, uh, lobbying for it. How does that work? Well, first and, and foremost is we've got over 5 million grassroots activists involved, and they're the ones that are primarily responsible for spreading the message. But you're you're right. We've been blessed with spokespeople that are far beyond anything my wildest dreams could have imagined. Uh, you and I were talking off air. Our mutual longtime friend Rick Santorum yes. is now a senior advisor for the organization. Great, amazing Catholic man who's become a mentor and friend to me. Uh, yes. We have Mike Ferris, the founder of the homeschool movement, great evangelical Christian leader. He's my co-founder of the organization. He just retired from Alliance Defending Freedom. They were co-counsel on the Dobbs case. Uh, he led them through that. He feels like he's accomplished the pinnacle of his legal career. And so now mm. he's come back to Convention of States. Uh, we had Senator Tom Coburn, God rest his soul, before he passed away, was with us for the last five years of his career. Uh, Mark Levin, uh, Ben Shapiro, Sean Hannity, Pete Hegseth from Fox and Friends. I mean, too many to list, really, luminaries who've stated their support for Convention of States. Uh, just this week, interestingly, in New Hampshire, uh, new presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy came out and endorsed Convention of States. Governor Ron DeSantis is an endorser of Convention of States. Uh, Governor uh, uh, Abbott here in Texas is an endorser of Convention of States. So it's a long list of folks. Very impressive list. And, uh, you know, again, it corresponds to something that, you know, when I think of this theme of re restore, removing power from Washington back into the hands of the people, I, I think of President Trump's first inaugural address because he said it in that speech. Uh, he said, this is not so much about transferring power from one party to another, he said on that day, but of transferring power from Washington back to you, the people. And uh, so many of the the America first policies and so many of the things we've seen the conservative movement fight for uh, are right along this the lines of this theme. So one would expect that the kind of people you just mentioned would uh, be behind something like this. What can our viewers do uh, uh, day by day to help support this effort? Yeah, you know, I think that's one of the most important questions you can ask because all of us are frustrated by the direction of the country. I mean, the numbers show it's it's the vast majority of us, regardless of party ideology. And so what they can do is get involved. And folks can go to conventionofstates.com. First thing is sign the petition. And when they do that, that petition will be automatically sent to their state representative and their state senator so they know they support it. And then I think the most important thing, click on the Take Action tab, because it's not enough for folks to watch you and I talk about these things. They actually have to get involved. If we're gonna retain our liberty, Reagan said that it's never more than one generation from extinction. Each generation has its own fight. Folks gotta get in and engaged in the fight. They click on the take action tab. They can volunteer for a whole bunch of different positions. Whether you got an hour a week or 40 hours a week, we need your help. And there are tens of thousands like you who are engaged in the fight today. Well, friends, I want to urge you to get involved in this effort. We'll continue talking about it. And Mark, we, we can have you come back at some point in the future. And when we've got more states added in, you can give us a progress report. Um, you know, as we finish up here, just, you know, just in case people are thinking in the audience, well, what is, okay, I understand, you know, the, the, the spending, the, the term limits, but you know, one of the things you said, I think is one of the most consequential aspects of this, when these term limits are applied to those bureaucrats who are nameless, faceless, uh, people, but who either help or hinder uh, the will of the American people. I, I, I mean, I have, I have been astonished over recent years in hearing some of the inside stories, as 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 you know, you know as well as anyone too, uh, whereby you know President Trump, for example, would be advancing uh, some 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 very important policies that the American people wanted to see and and did see, um, and yet. The people working in those thousands of people working in these bureaucratic offices, some of them holdovers from previous administrations who ideologically were at the opposite end of the spectrum, literally not just slow walking, but but actually opposing the very things that the president was trying to implement. These people were not elected. And I mean, who are they? 
to 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 impede the work that they're being paid to do. I mean, we have a big problem with this, don't we? And and wouldn't this convention of states effort be able to take that problem away? Yeah, you know, I think you're nailing one of the most insidious problems we have in the American system of governance, which is we were never intended to have an administrative state. And Trump did run into this headlong. I don't think anybody knew how deep and dark the problem was. You know, we use the term deep state now, and we all know exactly what that means, and it's not a conspiracy theory, it's a fact. Five years ago, you'd be laughed at for saying that. Right. But it, it existed back then as much as it exists today. And you mentioned something else that they were not only resisting, they were out in the open, they actually called themselves the resistance. And people openly in the administration said they weren't going to carry out Trump's policies. They are unelected, they are unaccountable, I think we need to do away with federal uh, unions. There should be no federal employee unions. FDR, no great conservative, said they were incompatible with public service. And then I think we need to limit the terms of those people because what makes them so invested in keeping power in Washington, D.C. is they're going to do 30 or 40 years in D.C. That should not be allowed. It was never intended by the framers. We need to gut the power of the federal agencies. Mark, this has been a great discussion. Uh, again, I want to urge our audience, go to conventionofstates.com, get involved in this, spread the word about it, talk about it, sign the petition, do the things that you see there on the website. Let's get power back into the hands of the people. Mark, would you pray with me for a couple of minutes now as we conclude our, our broadcast? Father, Lord, we, we, we thank you for America. We thank you for the vision of our founders who were shaped Lord God, by your word, uh, who knew the corruption uh, uh, that human nature is subject to and who built into our system safeguards against that corruption. But Lord, we've got to we've got to utilize the system they gave us. Uh, we've got to 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 use the power in order to uh, preserve that power in our hands. Uh, and Lord, we ask you, therefore, to bless this effort, help your people to gain the vision. Uh, behind this effort and help us to persevere with one another in all peace and joy of soul as we know that we are on the side of freedom and ultimately, Lord God, on your side. And in that spirit, we pray the words that Jesus himself gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, Mark Meckler, Convention of States, thanks so much for being with me today. It's been a real blessing to talk to you. It's been my honor to be with you. Thanks a lot. All right, we will see you soon. And friends, we will see you as well. Tell others about Praying for America. Follow me on social media at FR Frank Pavone on all the major platforms. We thank Right Side Broadcasting. Follow them at RSB Network. And thank you, Getter, for carrying our programs and, and all the other platforms that do as well. And friends, we will talk to you again tomorrow. Priests for Life, saving lives for over 30 years.